morning, everyone. My name is Jasmine. I am the Director for Defence Members at the Prince's Trust Australia. Um, so we were established in 2013 to represent the uh, charitable interests of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, known to most people as Prince Wales. Um, and I am here in our capacity with our defence portfolio. So the work that we do with veterans and family members um, to inspire you all into entrepreneurship and help you build the confidence, the skills and the networks you need to do that. Um, I am joined today by the wonderful Michael Mitch Mitchell. Um, he's actually an alumni of our program from 2017, but also a soldier on Pledge Partner. Mitch, do you want to say a couple of words before I crack into an icebreaker? Um, yeah, not a problem, Jazz. Thanks very much for the introduction, Prue and Jazz. Um, my name is Michael Mitchell, but um, as most people know, if you've been in the Defence Force for any period of time, that most people actually go through and give you a nickname. So, um, shortened of a surname, Mitch is what it is. Um, I've, uh, I'm, I'm one of the four directors of uh, Elysium um, EPL, which is a professional uh, services firm based out of Canberra, which started in 2016 17. Um, but today, basically, what I'm here for is to provide an opportunity to share my experiences as a small business starter, owner, entrepreneur, um, and give you the opportunities to ask as many questions as humanly possible um, so that I can help you along your way. Um, and uh, I can share some of my, my successes and mistakes to, to make your life Awesome. Thanks, Mitch. Um, guys, we're going to kick off with a question for you. Um, we're actually going to use an analogy, so a running track analogy. We're really interested in understanding where everyone is sitting in the wonderful journey that is self-employment. So if you can imagine yourself on a running track, uh, either at a school or a university, um, and the running track is the journey of self-employment, whereabouts are you sitting? So are you on the sidelines watching people in self-employment interested in joining? Are you at the starting line of joining the race? Are you in the race already? Have you done multiple laps of the race and this is your second or third business? Um, if you could use the chat function to let us know what, on, what part of the journey of self-employment are you on at the moment and what's really driving you to attend this session today, that would be very helpful. Um, and we can tailor some of our conversation to that. So um, use the chat function, let us know in the analogy, are you in the race? Are you watching the race? Have you not even bought your ticket yet, but are considering to buy the ticket? Um, and that'd be really helpful. Uh, and thank you, Andrew, for going first and telling us that you're starting the race. That's really good. Watching from Liana, fantastic. So while you guys all pop where you are on that race, um, I'm going to ask my first question of Mitch, which is, why are you wearing your hat? Um, firstly, um, I have been wearing hats for a long time now, basically because hey, I'm going bald and I don't want to get skin cancer on top of my head. But um, it's always from a, I don't know, military's always had a hat on, so it's been something which has actually continued on. But I also look at it as, as something which uh, is a talking point. You can go through, protect your head. Um, you can have sensible ones. You can have boring ones. You can have ones which people just sit there and go, why on earth is he wearing that? Um, and it makes people um, probably sit there and, and look from the outside and go, what is this person really about? So this one, for instance, um, is pulled out of a, a, a cupboard in the garage. And basically, I believe it came from um, my kids and it gives me the opportunity to sit there and go, okay, I can show something a little bit silly, a little bit funny, it's got some lovely stuff on it, but I can also go through and put on a lovely Cuban hat, which is quite nice. I won't tell you what my wife told me about this one, um, but she said that was a, a wonderful looking opportunity to um, probably go, go up north somewhere. And this one um, is a little bit different itself, but I think out of all of them, I think it, it a hat can show my personality and, and I think there's a bit of a clown um, at times. I think this one is going to stay on my head for the time being. Thanks, uh, Mitch. So why is showing your personality important for starting a business or being a business? Um, the ability to actually own your business, it, it, it is you. It is who you are and what you know, how you want to move forward. Is, um, you can portray in so many different ways. You can do it in, in uh, and by the way you talk, what you wear, um, and I think through a hat off with the ability to go through and, and, and live my own clown-like behaviour at times through um, silly hats. I think if you can actually remember someone by having a, um, a little bit of a funny funny thing about them, it makes life easier. Awesome. And for the benefit of everyone in the room today, uh, can you just take us through, through your journey? What made you start a business? Why did you do it? Um, give us the spiel and then we can open up to q &A. All right. In a nutshell, um, 
I never expected to be a business owner. I never expected that at one time in my life I'd be sitting here on the other end of a of a uh, Teams chat talking about me being in business. Um, I came from a Navy family, um, basically saw myself as a career Navy fan, um, Navy man and basically entered um, Navy by ADFA. Initial training in patrol boats and frigates um, and uh, I misbehaved um, quite a bit in my early days. So I travelled lots. Um, but it was where I started understanding about the leadership piece, not just managing, um, but actually leadership, understanding about being able to plan, understand what risks, time management. Um, after that, I ended up going to submarines. Um, basically, some people said, why on earth would you go into the water for a job? But I have to say, I spent the next 10 years of my life in submarines and had an absolute ball. Some of the best people that I've ever worked in, uh, professional, output orientated, um, and I really started at that time to understand it uh, from a prioritisation point of view and safety and then planning. Um, for personal reasons, um, about uh, 10 years into it of, of being tired, I made the hard choice at that time to stop a Navy career, a seagoing career, and end up going to a shoregoing um, job here in Canberra. And basically I've spent six years running through um, doing a shore job here um, where I got comfortable. Um, my daughter tells me I got cuddly. Um, and I had the ability to experience different things on the other side, so not necessarily just having a military career, I actually had a, a personal life as well, which was something that military and deploying and submarines didn't necessarily allow. So, I, as I said, I got comfortable, I had um, kids, uh, started coaching rugby, I got into a routine of living life. Um, late in that sort of time frame, uh, my journey in Navy sort of uh, had a bit of a roadblock uh, or a hiccup at the time when my daughter got a little bit sick. Um, and at that stage, it was a, a why um, junction in my, my life where I turned around and said, OK, um, what do we actually need to do? And so to help look after her, I ended up taking a short term contracting role um, outside of Navy. Now, that actually provided me the opportunity um, to experience what it was like as, as, a, as a mister as opposed to a, a serving member. But it gave me the opportunity to understand uh, what else I could achieve. Because of that being wanting to be a career Navy man, it gave me a chance to look at what could I give back? What could I actually do? And therefore, what would be the mechanism for me to be able to do that? And so that was my first sort of thought process into um, being a Navy, also being a, an entrepreneur. The term entrepreneur, I'm not necessarily a massive fan of, but I think the concept of being an entrepreneur, a small business owner, um, I, I look at uh, I look at being a, as a business owner, more of an entrepreneur, is something which I, um, um, as, as align myself with. So anyway, long, long story short, first contracting job um, came out and I started up and actually met Princess Trust Australia at the time and I got a scholarship to lead your own business program, um, which was based out of RMIT. And that program gave me the opportunity to be educated in how to actually run a small business. Um, and I've got to say, it was uh, drinking from a fire hose um, and that was my first opportunity to start going, oh wow, how am I actually going to keep myself a, up a, a head above water, um, but I tell you what, uh, doing a full time job and that was quite quite different. So when I first left the contracting job, I applied for another job with a firm up out of, out of Sydney and basically three other guys who worked in that firm decided they wanted to reach out and start their own company up and they said they wanted a fourth person and of which they remembered me and said, hey, let's give Mitch a call and see where he's at. I said yes and that was 2016 and so all of a sudden, um, I signed up and we had four of us at the beginning um, and we're now at 23 in total and we're still growing. We basically brought another person on yesterday um, and we have contracted bodies of work going out to 2024 now, which is fantastic. So um, yeah, it wasn't where I suppose the main thing out of that was jazz and, and everyone else. My journey at the beginning of my naval career did not end, did not have me ending up running my own company um, with three other great guys and to primarily give back to defence. So, yeah. so that's the journey. Um, it was uh, a roundabout and um, my daughter um, is better, so life is good. Um, Mitch, I want to unpack something that you mentioned there around skills and also not calling yourself an entrepreneur. Um, so in terms of the skills that you thought best place you to start uh, your self-employment journey. Can you just talk us through what you reckon you took from your time in defence that you've applied now into your civilian yes. career as an entrepreneur? Um, I have to say when, when I sat down and thought about actually how do I work back into as a civilian back into the military but as a, as a business owner, uh, I couldn't have answered that question um, four years ago, Jazz, easily. It was, I'd have to say that 
the time management, the ability to actually go through and schedule things, um, curiosity, actually saying how can we actually make things better. Um, some people say strategic thinking, but I, I like the term outcome focus. So what is the outcome you're aiming to achieve? Um, the, I think uh, resilience, the ability to understand what, um, how to bounce back after getting knocked back down. Um, I'm finding the more and more um, jobs that I actually ask for or put forward for, um, you continually do get told no. So all of a sudden it's like, uh, how do you actually bounce back from that knockback? Your network is huge. Um, uh, actually having friends and, and family and workmates and everything else is, is, a, is a very, very important thing. Um, and having, I suppose on that, networking is wonderful. Um, and when you sit there and ask people about different opportunities of how they can support you, when I was telling someone recently that I was actually coming in online to do this program, that they said, oh, have you got another hat? And I was like, not really. Um, why it's in the creek. But um, they turned around and said, well, we've got another opportunity for you instead of a hat. And so all of a sudden, um, I had the opportunity to get a, a fully functional gas mask on loan from a, friend, from a friend who said, this is fantastic. So your network can be important, but it's somewhat scary that he had a fully functional gas mask um, available for you. So, um, yeah. I love that you, really, you um, touched on this, this thing around networking, Mitch, because there's some really interesting research from the US that talks a lot about the uh, different types of networks that veterans bring into their civilian career. So a lot of veteran networks, um, for those that are not aware, are actually considered quite closed according to LinkedIn. So you have really deep and amazing networks um, with other veterans and family members, but might not necessarily have the openness or networks with those that are outside of those that you may have served with or lived with. Um, so I think touching on your point around networking being really important for business, um, yeah, would you say it's the one of the most important things that you do? Um, it's probably not the most, but I think um, it's probably one of the biggest challenges I've got as well. Um, it is because you do have such a big network, and at least in my environment, the, the, the firm that we're releasing, we're looking at supporting defence from the outside in. So there is a really a big fine balance on how do you actually manage your network? Um, because I'll be honest with you, I never want to go through and ruin a friendship as I go through. I want to maintain my friendships and my network, and so it really is um, something which I've tried to work hard on is how do I go through and maintain that separation of saying to a friend, hey, I want to come and um, talk to you about actually a product that we can do or a service that we can provide, to then going friendship, work, friendship, or and then actually delineating that and, and being quite transparent in that process. Um, it hasn't been easy. I've actually um, had a bit of mentoring from a, another friend of mine who was in Navy, who got out of Navy, um, then worked for a large um, international arms firm, and all of a sudden he's back in Navy again, and I've probably had about uh, three or four months of support there on, on how to actually do that. That's so good. Um, I recognise I've asked you quite a number of questions, and this is supposed to be a Q&A with everyone on the call. So, guys, we have one question from Shane already, but I'd encourage you to use the chat to ask some questions. Um, I have some others that I can ask. Um, Mitch, but I would rather you ask them of him. Um, Shane, if you feel comfortable, do you want to unmute your mic and just kind of explain a bit about your question around the current uh, economy and how Mitch is responding to that? Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Uh, g'day, my name's Shane. Yeah, so what I've actually seen over the last six, seven months, like everyone else, um, with the business economy and how Australia is going, especially with what today is just where they're going to come out with the Australian Financial Review, how we see basically the economy going in businesses. And so at the moment, your major client is Defence, and so I'm still in the Army and stuff. And the so, way I've sort of seen things go, because what, what I do for a living, I'm actually working in the cyberspace. So I'm actually doing cyber training. And so I've actually seen all these online platforms start appearing, and a lot of the business practices now are going into virtual like this. And that's how I basically got onto this. Soldier on, came up there, get into networking. And but what it's giving though, it's giving everyone a broad spectrum of seeing everyone all around the world. How does it affect you when you're doing your business now? Do you do a lot from at home? Does it give you better resources to do things, or is it more limiting to get logistics? And because that's how we're sort of finding it, like with all the aircraft, you can't fly no more. How do we get so what, what what do you see from that it's in, it's in a basically um a space where we, we don't we don't know what's going to happen but 
how are you coping in that sort of strategy at the moment? Sort of like. So that's, yeah. that's, that's a pretty good question, Shane, because <laughs> I, know. I think yeah. the, the hard whole one. economy, <laughs> um, the uh, COVID, um, the online yeah. piece, uh, it's, it's been quite a significant problem. I, I, I totally agree with you, people going virtual, people actually starting to, to move virtually, can they work from home and everything else? Um, so I'll, I'll hit on your first point there about um, from COVID side of the house. COVID um, has been uh, a godsend, but also um, a massive pain in the butt. Um, <laughs> so it's been a godsend because it's actually given us the opportunity to allow um, customers, and I'll, I'll reference Defence here, to actually uh, turn around and go, actually, we can do things remotely. We don't have to have people in, in the office space to go through and actually work face to face. If you have the right IT systems and you have the right setup, you've got the ability to actually have a team of people working remotely to still achieve the aims. And, and um, this is where I think, um, from a leasing point of view, we had a, a very broad brush um, uh, business continuity plan at, at the beginning of, the, of, of, of COVID. And all of a sudden, we had a massive admin overhead um, to actually go through and try and get our own systems, our own ICT, our video conferencing, our internet, our working with Defence from a security point of view, making sure that our systems were aligned. So whilst it was a, a, a painful thing for nationally and internationally, I think yeah, we've, we've now got an ICT system and structure in place which is, which is quite resilient. We have mechanisms in place for a, from an admin side of the house where when we bring people on board we've got WHS sorted out and we actually ask the questions about your home office area. Um, can we actually manage the security framework of what we've got with the, the work we're doing? Um, I have to say recruiting over COVID, that's probably been one of the biggest challenges where you can't sit down face to face and actually talk to someone. You can't sit down and see their body language. You can't understand how they're going to go through and answer a question in a way which is a little bit challenging to most because all you're seeing is really a head. You don't know whether they're actually sitting there in a nice shirt with a, with a pair of tracksuit pants and no shoes on at the computer table. Um, all these questions you sit there and just go, how do you answer this? And so it, it's all of a sudden putting in different processes in place. Um, how do you have a team working together to actually go through and um, maintain contact and have a bit of camaraderie through to core in your own company when everyone's working from home? It's a, it's a different piece. You might see a guy outside climbing a ladder. He's just climbing onto my roof. Oh, yeah, I see the guy. So it's, it's been a challenge, but it's been good. The economy, I think Australia's turning around. Um, how do we buy Australian? Um, how do we go through and actually improve our own um, national piece? And so I think that's one of the things the government's trying to do now is how do we actually turn um, to us to internal domestic capabilities and so I think whilst it's going to be hard I think the government's looking at the right way of doing it. Just yeah, I'm sort of working in the space for the cyber at the moment so I'm seeing that with all that especially with all the budgets coming out at the moment and as you know if you understand the white paper there's a lot of uh, resources and funding coming out it's just a skill shortage to be able to do it that's the hardest thing at the moment yep. getting the right yeah yeah I'm really glad you asked that question Shane because um Prior to COVID, the number, there were two skills that were most in demand in the Australian economy um, that I think are quite relevant actually when we move into COVID. The first one was creative problem solving. So it's the greatest skill that employers are looking for that they're not necessarily seeing um, in employees through their um, CVs or however they're approaching jobs. Um, and the second was, was communication. And we're equally, um, now that COVID's hit, we're seeing a lot of research that's coming out that suggests that one of the most important skills for people um, in a post-COVID world is actually agility, which is quite remarkable because I would, uh, to your point, Mitch, I would argue that agility is an incredibly important skill for someone who is moving into small business because you have to stay really agile to the needs of your customers and how the market is changing and, and being able to respond to that. Um, which I think leads into Philip's question. So Philip, do you want to unmute yourself and ask Mitch your question around the skill piece? Sure, thanks. Go, no, Michael. Phil, um, for those in the audience, Michael and I have known each other since he was about eight. And when I left the fence at the end of last year, he uh, was very useful advice to me when I started off my own consultant. The question, Michael, is you talked about the skills that you acquired in Navy. Can you also describe the skills that you've got during the course to get under the sources for the Princess Trust scheme, 
And which of those skills or aspects in particular have been most useful to you since? Um, I feel. <laughs> um, okay. Um, the course itself was great. Um, there was, I think we had just under 20 odd people who sat down, all people who wanted to start up their own company or business or who were looking at transitioning. And um, it was a diploma of small business management. So it covered off on everything that you could possibly think about um, for starting off your company. And the output, uh, again, coming back to the outcome of, of the course, was you had a business plan that was presentable to a bank to go for a loan. Um, and so it was done in that fidelity. The biggest thing about that course that it gave me was an understanding of probably all the individual business pillars that were in, in uh, or required to be actually managed. Um, so I've just written down a few notes after reading your piece uh, there. Um, risk awareness. Um, basically, it gave me an opportunity to go through and understand the risks um, to go through. In, in this endeavour, this is what I'm aiming to achieve, but what are the risks associated with what I'm aiming to do? So. Um, so starting a consultancy business, what are some of the risks? Single source, so um, going back to Shane's point about the economy, um, if I've only got one customer, um, all of a sudden I've got all my eggs in one basket, how can I spread that risk and have a bit of organisational resilience? Um, so trying to, to broaden. Um, the business plan, um, in submarines, if, if we had an adage, if it wasn't written down, um, it didn't happen. Um, but it gave you the ability to go through and um, have that business plan in such a way that was um, to cover off on all the main points. So you looked at marketing, you looked at insurances, you looked at your um, business research, you looked at your competitive research, you looked at what are the financial overheads that you actually need to meet, what profit do you want out of your company, um, do you want 10%, 5%, 20%? And so from the get-go, you had all of your structure established right at the beginning. So having a business plan was good. Um, Education, self-awareness, um, being able to go through um, and understand what you knew and what you didn't know. Um, I, I came in there and went, holy crap, finances, um, how do I do this? And all of a sudden, it, one of the things in my own head straight away turned around to, if I don't have a skill set, I don't want to be a jack of all trades. And when I'm financially able to, I want to go through and outsource those things. So could I outsource bookkeeping? Could I outsource a solicitor? Could I outsource marketing, PR? Um, those sort of things straight away. So it, it, that self-awareness piece was fantastic. Um, yeah. Um, what else was there? Uh, can I jump in there, Mitch, for you? Sure. Um, I really love the, this concept around outsourcing skills because um, I don't know, does anyone know how many small businesses there are in Australia or there were prior to COVID? Obviously, that's had a bit of an impact on the economy. Um, if you can use the chat function, have a guess at how, what percentage of businesses in Australia are small businesses? Because I think this will give some context to Mitch's point around outsourcing services. Um, it's an important part when you start your self-employment journey that you do recognise the skills that you do have. All right, we've got 75, 60 to 70. Mitch, you're not allowed to put percentage in of your, yeah. <laughs> you're not allowed to guess. No, it's <laughs> Mate, you're the expert. No. <laughs> ah, very interesting. Um, so for those that have guessed, 98% of all businesses in Australia are small businesses, right? So small businesses between one person, so a sole trader, um, I think up to 19 or 20 staff. But the majority of those small businesses, so of the 98% in our economy, 67% of them are sole traders, so one person which is a remarkable number of small businesses. So we're at 2.2 million prior to COVID. That was the 2019 stats from the ABS, um, which really gives you a sense of the scale of people in Australia that, that are operating small businesses in so many different industries. So you can have people like Mitch who are uh, in industries that are consulting back to defence. You have people doing retail, hospitality. You've got organic skincare people making candles. You have clothing businesses. I mean, everything, the full gamut of it. And really, it is the backbone of our economy and such an important industry for people to explore um, and to explore safely. Back to um, Mitch, your own journey. I think you kind of dipped your toe in the water before you were um, ready to kind of jump straight into the pool. Am I right? Um, yeah, that's correct. And so it was 
<laughs> yeah, single shingle, just doing a single contract back into the fence to all of a sudden coming um, into a fully fledged um, on panels and everything else. So it was, yeah, it was uh, quite a nerve wracking piece to understand how to do it. Um, Phil, yeah, just one last point on yours. Um, the ability to have stuff documented down at the beginning um, gives you the ability not to worry about it later. Um, so if you have, if you're setting up a company, you can go onto the ASIC website and you can go up and start your own company and, and do all that. But having the ability to actually go to someone such as an accountant who can set it all up appropriately for you, set up your GST, um, advise you on the right things um, right from the get-go, um, I think that is that is a must-have. Um, my accountant, I, I love her dearly. Um, I've got two, one for my, my personal and one for the company. Um, <clears throat> but I have to say, uh, she sits there and says, my job is not to get you as much money back as in a tax return. My job is to keep you out of jail. And if you make a mistake, I'm throwing my stapler at you. Um, and that's the sort of that's the sort of relationship that I think is fantastic that I have with her. That she can sit there and do it, and I'm scared of her. But, but I know that she will keep me safe in the entire way through. So having the right documentation set up from the get go at the beginning is a wonderful, wonderful thing to keep you safe as you progress through the journey. Great answer. Thanks, mate. Guys, do we have any other questions in the chat? Um, otherwise, Mitch, I might have a question for you. Oh, we just um, got one. Shane just pop in. Shane got another one. Yep. How do you tender for contracts as SME for companies like Defence or Government and remain competitive with new innovation? Um, Okay, so um, the big beasts that are out there, um, the big companies, so at least from my point of view, when I'm looking at going back into the events, and I understand that not everyone is going to have the same sort of customer set, um, but you'll have the same sort of concepts um, that are, you'll always have someone who is bigger. You may have a Coles, you may have um, a, a, a IKEA uh, furniture, you may have a, um, a massage company that's bigger than you and, and trying to provide services. But when you start actually looking at um, tendering back into um, those large organisations, there's a lot of different ways you can look at it. You can look at, okay, you can go point to point. So you can do business to business or you can go, um, you can go to the actual customer itself and try and be that niche body. So if you are going straight to the customer, it's looking at that niche sort of outcome of what are you providing um, and that they actually want you um, there. When you're starting to look at um, small to medium enterprise, um, depends on government, how do you make competitive? Um, we basically go through and try and um, <clears throat> bang for buck for what we bring. So we are specialists in how we do it and what we provide. Um, we provide unsolicited proposals to them saying this is what we can do. And, um, this is the background, this is what we can do for you. This is how we can make you um, either successful or operate better. Um, there's a lot of other industry support mechanisms out there. So from, um, for, I think, one of the other enterprise discussions that we had, we spoke about um, grants and how can you actually get grants um, in support of the areas that you're looking at. So uh, one, one of the previous um, sessions, we had a counsellor and all of a sudden it was like, how can you get a grant from DDA to actually support for defence counselling? Or how can you go through the Centre for Defence Innovation um, Hub and actually register on there to actually go through and get grants and in support of going back into defence? Um, and so there's, there's a number of different ways you can do it, um, but it's, it's a hard thing trying to compete against the bigger ones uh, because they'll always undercut the price that you offer. Um, and so what you have to bring is your bank for buck. What are you doing that's, that's probably a little bit different? Uh, is a niche skill set which they can turn around and say, yes, we do like what you're offering, and yes, we can look forward. Yeah, so very much your unique value proposition, Mitch. You know, what, what makes you different to somebody else? Because there's going to be a lot of people um, post-COVID who can offer services across the country. You don't necessarily have to live and work in the place that you're offering your services. Yes. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, Shane, I think you had a follow-up question there around leveraging, or did we touch on that already? Yeah, you basically touched on that. It's just like sometimes if you're a smaller company, you can also, what they can provide, because you're niching into that with their company, you can provide that with a larger company where they have the leverage because they have the constant supply chain. Because if you're only small and you can't keep up with it, they will look for someone else where they can keep up with demand. That's why family defence. That's a switch. Um, 
I have a question for you, Mitch. Uh, obviously, a lot of people had indicated earlier in this session that they were either watching or starting or maybe even thinking about buying the ticket for the Reno race that is self-employment. Um, can you give your tips on what would you say to someone who was exploring self-employment, um, some of the advice or, you know, step one, two and three? What would you suggest they follow? Um, all right. Um, in no particular order here, um, you don't need a 100% solution. Um, yeah, I think if you are a single shingle or if you've got a probably a staff or one or two, an 80% solution where you can um, get you across the line is okay. Um, and some things, if you if that 20% is, is, I think there's an analogy out there, the 20% work to get you to 100% will generally take about 80% of the time. Um, understanding where that line is um, to go through and say, actually, I am going to only support what I need. I'm only going to do what I can do um, before I have to move on to, to something else. So, um, understand what outcome you're aiming to achieve. Um, if you have an outcome which is, for me, I didn't have an outcome to start off. It was like, oh yeah, I can get into business. This is fantastic. Um, but what what is what is the definition of success? And since then, um, I know that uh, for my wife Jordana and I, we want we want to live on a boat um, when we get older. And so success for me is being able to work and live and have a work life balance where my family and I, in the future, can sit there and go, um, I want to I want to go to a boat. I want to sit there and, and enjoy um, post COVID times because COVID is going to end at one stage. Post COVID times on a boat uh, to go from there. Um, some things are going to be crap. You're not going to like doing it. Um, you're not going to like actually staying up late at night, actually going through and doing business admin. Um, it's like having kids and changing nappies. It's got to be done, but it's still shit, pardon my French. Um, so it's, yeah, you've got to go through and do it. Understand how to prioritise. Um, yeah, what's the wolf closest to the sled? Um, it's going to be the next thing that's going to bite you in the bum. If you are going through and, and busy all the time and you're flat chat all the time, you're pretty much going from one wolf to another wolf to another wolf or another analogy to, to a different spot by. So, yeah, um, don't lose your personality. <laughs> um, you, you can you can go you can go through and, and lose who you are and say I need to be this personality, be a small business owner and a professional services man. Actually, no, you can still be you. You can still hold on to your own personal values um, and create your successful business image as you um, and not somebody else's. There's a time to play, I suppose. That's some great advice. Um, I had some really similar stuff uh, earlier this week. Um, really interesting, actually, the concept, uh, and I'd love your thoughts on this, Mitch, that uh, you have you, you do business for many different reasons. So you um, can do business particularly for work-life balance. I think that's what attracts a lot of people into self-employment. Being able to be your own boss is quite an a attractive concept, despite all the business admin that you do late at night that resembles nappy changing. Um, there's, uh, can you give some tips to people? Um, I think around, you, you know, it can be quite overwhelming. So how do you... How do you navigate this big beast that is self-employment um, and maybe some stuff around fear, fear of failure? Because we do know that a lot of businesses um, aren't successful. Um, some people call it failure. Other people uh, call it pivoting. And um, we do see a lot of businesses in Australia moving from one need to another, which is um, particularly relevant in COVID. Um, how have you navigated that fear of just everything is on your shoulders? Um. That's a, a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> um, I didn't check you under the bus there, did I? <laughs> uh, um, I, I personally was, um, personally was, I, I, I hate the concept of failing. Um, I would sit there and say that whilst I look at myself as being somewhat of a, of a perfectionist and, and succeeding in life, um, fear of failure has driven me to achieve. Um, um, or, or push myself to actually go through and do it. Where I've come unstuck is actually going through and saying, I need to succeed, succeed at everything. And what I was talking before about actually going through and putting in a tender and, and not being successful, and I've actually had to turn around and right at the beginning of that tender proposition is going, actually, I'm going to put a 40% success rate on this because if I don't, all of a sudden, I'm going to start expecting and expecting and expecting. So setting your expectations at a level which are appropriate 
um, is definitely important. I think the concept um, of having um, your framework set up to it to accept um, failure. So when we look at our, from the leasing point of view, when we look at our pipeline of, of business coming in, we start at the beginning with a, with a, a success rate of 10%. And so when we start a proposal, we start writing it up, we've written the proposal, um, established communication with the, with the client, all of a sudden you're starting to increase in your confidence or you actually start dropping it down. And so having a mechanism in that way to actually assign a success rate from the get-go is actually um, a good thing. But yeah, um, I don't handle it well, um, but having a team around you with a process that actually works is, um, has definitely been great. So um, the other directors and our business manager from Elysium um, have been fantastic in that. Um, that leads me to another question around uh, lead generation and attracting new clients in COVID when a lot of us cannot leave our homes or have limited capacity to leave our homes. Um, how are you managing new clients and maintaining existing clients? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so lead generation, the first one, um, I'll have to say that one's actually succeeding at the moment based on networking. Um, working back into the fence and the like has been a challenge um, because uh, a lot of the major service providers, at least from the defence point of view, uh, are getting the bulk of the work. So um, it comes back to it. people knowing who you are and people knowing that the work that you do is actually successful. When you're starting out, um, this is going to be significant challenges because your your reputation, your marketable product, um, your, your business value proposition, I've got that in the right order, um, is actually harder to get out there. And so it really does um, start to become a, a problem. The, the marketing means getting your voice out, um, calling people, emails, understanding what people's products are, so doing your market research um, and actually being able to turn around and pull apart what you're offering and how it can make them work better in any which way you can, uh, I think it's important. That's fantastic. We have a question again from Philip. Um, do you want to unmute yourself, wait, and ask Mitch around this stuff around proactive sure. engagement? Sure, Michael. It, it's related to that last reply you just gave. So, how much of your work for Elysium would result from proactive engagement rather than reacting to RFPs that you see issued to panel members? And I guess part of the question is how important is that shaping of the business environment for your success? Um, the that proactive engagement probably gets about 80% of our business um, quite easily. So it's that it's that contact um, um, when you put the, the parlance of the, of the request for tenders. Um, we don't really see a lot of business coming out of that, um, but we do see a lot coming out of our engagement with people, um, either through face to face or either the, um, through email contact um, and reaching it that way. Um, but the reputation of the work that you that you have and that you've done in the past is, is really quite significant because if someone turns around and says, actually, I heard of a company doing that over there, they did a really, really good job, um, and all of a sudden you can go through and, 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 and leverage that sort of relationship. And so when you're talking about um, shaping the business environment, the next step in that is how do you advertise your successes? How do you actually go through and do it? So this is where it comes back to being that jack of all trades. If you are that single shingle, how do you actually market your successes um, and going through and saying, yeah, I've been really, really good here. Um, I've done a really good job. And so when you first actually start up that conversation, um, from a leasing point of view, we have a set up for success meeting at the beginning. So understanding what is the, uh, the, the customer want, our understanding of that is this, making sure that they do overlap. And then at the at, at the end of that, we say, and if, if we're really good at the end of it, can we actually go through and get a reference or, or a testimonial as to how we perform and can we advertise that? Because that is so, so important. Um, it's a bit harder in the fence because I don't generally like doing that, especially from Commonwealth organisations. Um, but from a private industry sector, it's, you, can, you can do that quite well. Okay. Celebrate your successes and advertise them. Thanks, Mike. That's a really good suggestion. Um, again, on service-based businesses, obviously a, a lot of the stuff that you sell, you could argue is sort of intangible. So how, for those that are starting service-based businesses, whether it's things like coaching, consulting, contracting something, um, can you walk us through how you understand the value that you're creating for your client? Like how did you 
knew, know that you were valuable? <laughs> and then how did you attach a price to that value? Um, this is actually going to go back to what Shane was talking about before and actually um, being a niche um, capability. So we're starting to see a lot more uh, um, proposals or, or a lot of our proposals are, are actually providing niche services. Um, and so as opposed to providing the general admin um, services that, that most companies um, can provide, that we, we have a skills base of HR, or, or a skills base of people who work in the company who have specific capabilities and a specific background. So we really do drive down that that niche area um, to enable them to, to see that what we could provide them is fantastic. Um, and so our under, with those people in place, their understanding of the system that we're actually going into is what we're selling. So, um, and like for us, we've got a, a legal, a, a lawyer, a collaborative contracting lawyer. We have a, um, a highly specialised engineer. Um, uh, obviously, we've got me, and we've also got another um, change management, intelligence services, and project management background uh, people. So we've got the ability to go through and, and say, in those areas that we're actually selling to, we can do um, really, really good work for you in selling it. Um, what is the value that we provide for you? Oh, I love that. Um, I've just put a back to everyone else. Um, does anyone have any last questions? We've got one or two more before we wrap up. Um, and in the meantime, Mitch, the best advice you've ever received, and please keep it PG. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, when I joined up, I had a friend of mine, um, and he got out of, um, he was a special forces guy, he got out of uh, the military two years before me, um, and basically he goes that some of the times you're going to have to go through and actually sell your skill sets that you actually have. You have the ability to go through and, and have all this history, but you may not like who you're selling it to, you may not like what you're selling it to. Um, or the purposes of what they're going to do it for. So you've got to have your business values, but you're going to have to sit there at some time and um, bite your fingers or your fingernails and go, yep, I understand that this is this is not necessarily where I wanted to be. However, when I look at the overall vision of what I want the company to go through and do, you may actually turn around and have to actually do some sort of work in those areas. Um, yeah. But yeah. No, I love that. That's probably the biggest the biggest piece is accepting that. Um, There's some stuff in there again around agility, you know, that, that your business will take you in ways that you might not expect, um, sometimes for good reasons. And, you know, you might be doing things you don't necessarily like, but there's a need for it. Yep. Really interesting. Um, Matt has a final question for you around DBA support. Matt, do you want to unmute yourself and just clarify that for us? Um, yeah, good day, everyone. Um, just as someone who's recently left uh, like a service career and is starting out, uh, what uh, assistance did DVA provide you um, whilst you were transitioning and after you've transitioned and, and how have they supported you? And I suppose how easy was it to obtain that support as well? <laughs> I can start that question, <laughs> Mitch. I feel like you're dealing with some uh, construction on the roof at the moment. It is. Um, so I, I, I can have a crack at this, Jess, from at least from my perspective. The DBA, um, when I transitioned out of Navy, there was a lot of um, the transition seminars and the like where they actually went through and spoke about um, how you can utilise DBA services. Um, it's been limited in my in, in my experience um, and. There's been a lot more support. Um, DBA will provide you the linkages of where, where you can go to, um, but I think the um, not-for-profit organisations such as PTA or, or Soldier Honor and some of the other ones that are out there are generally the, the main ones that I've actually got most of my support from um, through the through the scholarship or the, um, the Lead Your Own Business or, or through the Soldier or through the Pathways um, sort of the house. The, there is so many opportunities out there to get support from people who um, have had experience um, and had successes and failures um, who can actually come back and help you out. Um, so, yeah, I think they've been really good in, in actually providing those linkages, but I don't think they're the responsible bodies to, to be able to take that next step. Um, yeah. Chaz, I'm 
Absolutely. Yeah, no, I'll add, I'll add to that. That's a, um, a really good question, Matt. So there's a couple of things in there um, with DVA. So uh, DVA are big supporters of the work that we do at Prince's Trust. And I guess one of the benefits of us being quite an agile not-for-profit is that we can continue to change the um, products, I guess, or the services that we offer for veterans and family members who are interested in self-employment, depending on how your needs change. But there is one thing that DVA um, does do uh, with the NICE scheme, so the New Enterprise Something Something scheme. Um, I always forget acronyms. I'm not as good as, as those that have served uh, at my acronyms. But uh, the NICE scheme is uh, offered nationally, so they partner with a lot of uh, tertiary education institutions and then also some um, TAFE programs. Thank you very much, Deirdre. <laughs> I knew there was, a, there was an I in there somewhere. The New Enterprise Incentive Scheme, so N-E-I-S. Um, DVA does offer those that are on incapacity payments access to the NIS scheme um, with some allowances as well, depending on the business that you're starting. Um, but you can definitely access free services from Princess Trust at any point on your journey. So whether you're transitioning out or have been transitioned for a number of years, or if you're a partner of of someone who has served or is currently serving. Um, anything related to self-employment, big or small, you're exploring, you started, you're on the journey, whatever, Prince Trust is there for you. So um, yeah, we kind of fill that gap. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, I might ask a question of our participants. Um, guys, I just wanted to thank you very much. We have been on the phone for almost 50 minutes now. Um, Mitch, there is so much richness to what you have told our group, and I think there's, you know, close to 20 or 25 of us online this afternoon. Um, guys, for those that have been listening, it's often a really important thing that we uh, give our feedback and positive vibes to our guest speaker who um, had tech issues and construction noises going on in the background and being grilled on his life um, so if you could use the chat just to share one key takeaway that you've taken from the last hour um, we've had some really interesting conversations around value creation the skills that Mitch brings to defense um, how he's engaging with defense industry how he's responding to COVID-19 um, is there a particular thing that Mitch said that really resonates with you and could you pop that in the chat for us um, Jase, can I just say, just while, while that's actually happening, um, I cannot, um, I mean, you, you cannot underestimate, um, whilst everyone's going to have their own sort of process of saying, yes, I want to start my own business, but, um, and, but I know from my point of view that the work-life balance piece is so significant, um, uh, of being able to actually go through and, and manage a work-life balance, make sure you have one, um, it, it is all involving and encompassing. You can't do it. Um, I think you'll just burn yourself um, down. Um, get a hobby or something. I, I, I play rugby. No, I, I try to. Um, set up a routine um, with your partners. Um, uh, my, my, my wife Jordana is my um, is my backboard. So um, she sits there and she's a great check and balance for me. So hey, pardon my French. You're actually being um, a bit of a dick at the moment. Um, actually, come back to. To, to the house and so you can go through and, and work together so having someone who can be your 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 balance yeah i love that and and recognizing as well for those that are interested in starting a business it doesn't have to be an isolating journey for you um the small business community is remarkably um supportive we always believe in in providing help and advice to other small businesses. It's good karma for business owners to be supportive of others, um, even if you are in the same industry. Um, and with that in mind, Mitch, I might share our details in the chat if you're comfortable with that so that anyone can reach out to us. Um, we're can always I just say that if anyone anyone who's come through the Soldron um, Pathways team, we're ha more than happy to, to connect you with, with Jazz um, and Mitch as well. They are such astounding leaders and their insight and their wisdom um, about the entrepreneurship, whether you like the term or not, that journey um, is just huge. So, and as you know, we at the Pathways team is here to, to also support you um, so we can help connect the dots in any way, shape or form. So please do reach out to Jazz um, and on behalf of Soldron, Mitch, we're really excited to have Elysium EPL as a, as a pledge company and we look forward to celebrating that as well. So really um, huge. Thank you. That was an amazing presentation, guys. Thank you. Awesome. All right, guys, with that said, have a wonderful afternoon. Um, feel free to stay online if you'd like to keep chatting, but otherwise, we we'll hope to see you again soon.
Um, guys, seriously, reach out to me if you want to want to hit me up offline about asking questions. Um, happy for a phone call. Just send me an email um, um, to, the, to the link Jasper put up there. Um, I've gone through and spoken to other presenters in the past afterwards to talk about risks and issues that I've had, um, and I'm more than happy to make the same time for, for anyone supporting this program. So please do ask questions if you've got more now. Um, we've, we've still got more time, and happy to hang around for as long as possible. I'll just stop the recording now, but feel free to chat on, guys. Thank you. Bye.